the Joe Rogan experience. What is disturbing both of you most about what's going on right now? Well, I think we'd love to see a third way. So they're the pre-moderns, as it were, who have a very traditionalist, conservative approach. Try to get approach. this sucker up close to you. Sorry. Sorry about that. No Better? worries. Yeah, perfect. The, the pre-moderns who have a very traditional conservative approach to gender roles, to sex, to relationship. And uh, there are a lot of us in the modern world who would reject a lot of that. And then there, there are the postmoderns who want to throw out everything, want to throw out everything that evolution handed us, and in the meantime, pretend that it didn't happen, right? Pretend that it's not even based on reality. And there is a, there's a third way, and you know, maybe we need to call it modern as opposed to pre or postmodern, but uh, there's, there's a third way to navigate what, evolutionary is, what evolution has given us, what we can change, what we can't change, and how to actually recover some of you know, the sexiness and sex and the love and love and the romance and romance, and you know, understand that human beings are what we are from not just a hundred years back, but a thousand and ten thousand and a hundred million years back, we've had sex. Since you both taught at a university level, you, you've been around these students and you, you've seen this sort of postmodernist movement gain steam. What, what do you think is the cause of it? Like, what, what is the reason why people are projecting this sort of distorted idea that there's no differences between men and women and that all the differences in the genders are all, it's all propaganda or cultural or? So I, I think it actually arises from a relatively simple cause, that we all detect there's something not right about what we've been taught we detect there's something not right about the way civilization is structured. We can tell that there's nobody really at the helm. And you have a lot of people who are faced with some issue that to them is incredibly glaring, something that just absolutely needs to be solved. And so what they do is they look at that issue and they say, what would we have to, what would we have to say in order for that issue to be fully addressed? And the problem is, that we're dealing with a complex system. And if you optimize for any one solution, you cause a catastrophe across all of the other things that it's connected to. And if you're not focused on those unintended consequences, you tend not to understand why people are resistant to your solution. So for example, let's deal with the transgender issue. For the transgender community, and I don't, you know, this is not a monolithic community. I actually know quite a number of people within it who have a heterodox position. But in general, there is a sense that it is disrespectful not to simply recognize anybody who has decided to transition as a full-fledged member of the sex to which they have moved. That seems right. And if you are focused on uh, the humanitarian side of the question, maybe it even is right. But the problem is, if you say a person who identifies as a particular sex is that sex, suddenly you've actually caused a whole bunch of consequences that you weren't thinking of over in a biology class, over uh, in the prison system. I mean, is it true that somebody who says that they are female gets to go to a women's prison? Do we want to put... Uh, violent sex offenders in a women's prison because they declare themselves to be female. So not tracking the consequences that were not in your view when you decided on a particular solution is the reason that so many people have signed up for these really absurd notions. And part of what I hope we will get to today is that there is a, a principle at the core of understanding all complex adaptive systems, and it is diminishing returns. And diminishing returns sounds kind of arcane. Um, it has too close an association with economics where it was first outlined. Um, but the message of diminishing returns is that you can very often get 90% of a solution that you want and not disrupt other things unduly. But if you say, I want 100% of the solution to this problem, you'll cause a catastrophe. So getting people to realize, don't shoot for the utopia in which the problem you're talking about is 100% solved. If you can accept a 90% solution, then you can have a whole bunch of other things that you don't even realize you're using.
In defense of people that would try to go for 100%, though, isn't it one of those things where, like, you if you would negotiate, you would if you want $100, you ask for 150 Unfortunately, I mean, I think you're identifying something correct, that in part, the positions that we hear um, being deployed are not an honest reflection of the beliefs of many of the people who are espousing them. They are a negotiating tactic. But we can't do that with biology. You can't right. negotiate with biology. Biology is what it is, and then we can talk about which parts of it are amenable to being changed. And uh, as Heather pointed out, we're not advocating for a return to some traditional way of interacting between the sexes. We're advocating for uh, an enlightened way that uh, takes advantage of the freedoms we have that our ancestors didn't and um, tries to navigate the hazards that we're stuck with. Um, so you can't, you can't uh, negotiate with biology. You really ought to listen to what it is that nature is telling you and then say, all right, what does that leave open? Where can we shift things? But if you're going to require that we lie about what's true biologically in order to navigate to a solution, I guarantee you it will be unstable in the end. Yeah, well, the, the zeitgeist has begun to include such nonsense as chromosomes exist on a continuum. You know, there are X chromosomes and there are Y chromosomes. I haven't heard that one. Um, one of our children just heard that at his school. What did they mean by on a continuum? Who even knows? I, I, don't, know, I don't think they meant anything. I think what they intended to do was carve out freedom from a biological truth. Mm. And so if you say well, chromosomes look, are on a continuum, yeah. then it's very hard to disagree with that because it doesn't mean anything that we can uh, right. unpack. Well, I would say it's actually really easy to disagree with it and say no. You know, gametes aren't on a continuum. Sperm is sperm and eggs are eggs. Sorry. Discrete. Two of them, right? Chromosomes also not on a continuum, at least in mammals. Sex, Yeah. A continuum. Their intersex is real, but it's strongly bimodal, right? There's, there are males and there are females and there are a few people. It's rare but real that there are intermediate phenotypes. And gender is even more of a continuum, but still strongly bimodal. Have you folks heard about that new crayfish that they're battling in Europe? There's a giant crayfish yeah. in Europe that's female, and female only, and essentially is a clone. They, they reproduce by cloning. So they don't need a male partner, and uh, they're going crazy. And there's you know, a, a so lot of them. Great. For your first two sentences there, it sounded like there was a giant <laughs> crayfish <laughs> descending on Europe. It was a female, <laughs> and <laughs> she's mad. She's pissed. Yeah. <laughs> she's yeah. tired of all these lobster yeah. dinners. Yeah. No, that's right. this no, and, it's, and that's going to work for a while, right? And like yeah. asexuality has actually evolved in a few lineages, a few vertebrate lineages. There are some lizards that are asexual, and it's all females, and it goes mm. great until the environment changes. Right. Because if you're cloning yourself, you are, your children are going to experience exactly, are going to be exactly the same thing that you were. So if you were a good fit for your environment, the next environment better be the same or else your kids aren't going to be a good fit. So right. my feeling is that crayfish, I haven't followed the story a lot, but that crayfish is going to do terrifically moving into exactly the landscapes that it first mutated into existence in. And if you change the landscape a bit, it's going to stop doing so. Well. I think they just farm it for food if it's tasty. Yeah, no, well, no You don't doubt. have to worry about them breeding. Just get a ton <laughs> of right. them together. Crayfish are delicious. They, they are delicious. <laughs> I right. hope this is a good tasting variety. <laughs> <laughs> it's free food. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's kind of crazy. No, that's right. So uh, Heather and I were talking before the podcast started about, a, I think, a very important point when it comes to a lot of these uh, either progressive or right wing issues is that people tend to be extremely tribal and what they're really concerned with is winning. They, it becomes a competition of us versus them. It becomes our side versus their side, and they tend to exploit weaknesses and then attack to score points. And all ideas of being honest intellectually or looking at things objectively kind of go out the window. You ignore facts that diminish your position or your team's position and highlight things, even if they're not real, that would diminish the other side's position. This is a real problem that humans have with arguments, with, with, with being tribal, with being on different sides. I mean, we see it, we forget about tribes, we see it with people, where when there's a certain time when you see people arguing, there's a certain point where the argument has deteriorated to a competition. And it's no longer about what you're actually discussing, it's about who can win. 
Yeah. And so, this is what science is for. Yes. Yeah. Well, this well, is science <laughs> ought to yeah. be indifferent. When it's done well, it, it is indifferent to who's the stronger team. It should really just tell you what's true. And in fact, the reason to use science is to correct for biases. Um, but so Eric and Heather and I have a, uh, a phrase that is just shorthand for something, which is um, bad faith changes everything. There's a lot you can do in discussion with people with whom you disagree as long as you are on the same page to a large extent. Yes. And what you're describing is what happens when that system breaks down and people perceive themselves as needing to win against the enemy rather than on a team that is trying to navigate to what is true or what is the most desirable outcome uh, with respect to values that we all share or something like that. So what you're describing is a very common state. It is a lower, less capable state than a good faith environment where people who may disagree intensely agree on the basic rules and the desirability of figuring out what's true. And so maybe that's part of what uh, we can do here is try to point to where the good faith conversation can get to that the bad faith conversation is incapable of getting to the value really yeah i think that's that's a giant point it really is and it's a i mean it's really something that i would hope more people would adopt going into the future stop connecting yourself to these ideas and just let these ideas exist on their own and examine them objectively and rely on science rely on actual science to formulate your, your when you're talking about biological issues and that's when i say science is the answer to this it's not necessarily that we should accept no one should accept the findings of science just at, at face value but a scientific approach is i've got this idea what would have to be true if that were true and how can i possibly prove it wrong and you work harder and harder and harder to prove it wrong and if you can't then you have greater and greater and greater confidence that maybe it's right and so this, this is what we don't see in bad faith arguments, is no one is trying to prove themselves wrong. And that's, I mean, that sounds backwards the first time you, you hear it, but if you try to actually demonstrate that your own cherished beliefs are wrong and you can't do it, you have pretty good confidence at the end of that, and there is no actual end, but the longer you've gone, you have pretty good confidence that actually, I'm probably seeing something real here. I've asked myself, I've asked my friends, I've asked my enemies, is this thing right? And, you know, in an actual formal scientific setting, you do an experiment, you, you run the data, and you, you know, do the analysis. But is it right or is it not? Let's see if I can prove it's not, even though I really think it is. So you it's also really get, you get something, uh, there's a bonus that comes with it, which is, I don't know what else to say. It's super awesome, which is if you've tried to take your cherished idea, some hypothesis that you've come up with, and you've tried 16 different ways to show that it's wrong and you keep failing. Well, every one of those things you did to see whether what you thought was true is actually false now prepares you. When somebody now challenges you and they say, oh, but you haven't thought of this. Well, you have. You've been through it mm -hmm. 16 different ways and that gives you the ability to navigate almost anything that's thrown at you because uh, you have taken on the role of being your own harshest critic in order to make sure that what's left at the end of that process is really robust. The other thing um, that I, I want to insert here is that I think, A, I don't want to be put in the position of defending everything that's been published in the scientific literature as true because it looks like science. A lot of it isn't. A lot of what's published in the scientific literature is not valid. The methodology does not establish what people claim it does. And that's a big hazard for, for people like Heather and myself because you have to sort the wheat from the chaff in order to figure out what to defend and what to be agnostic about. Um, but I do think those of us who more or less get the story of what, let's say, human sexuality is about at a scientific level, and there's still a lot of mystery, but there's an awful lot that those of us who have studied it are in agreement about and civilization is not yet on the same page with those of us who have looked at it scientifically. One thing we have failed to do, I think, is to articulate what you will get in exchange for signing up for a scientific worldview on this topic. People do not realize that a scientific worldview is actually the thing that empowers you to navigate your own love life in an intelligent way. It will let you... And it's a lot more fun than it sounds when you say it that way. 
Yeah, it, it's <laughs> well, you know, there, there are all of these famous arguments about unweaving the rainbow, or you know, somebody challenged Feynman that um, he he was the kind of guy who would take apart a flower and destroy its beauty in order to figure right. out how it worked. And this, Feynman, this is the trope: science will destroy beauty. Right, and it it's won't. not true. No. It's not true. You will get a lot of value. You will waste less of your time on people that you shouldn't be interested in if you understand what game they're playing, even if they don't understand. <laughs>